Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. We are um, in the second message of, the, of our series, Rut to Revival. It is my privilege and honor to be here representing God and Pastor Ryan as we kind of cooperate here. This will be the last time I will be there, but Ryan will take over uh, this series, Rut to Revival. Uh, it is just fascinating when, when I study this and to realize how God is good. And we struggle, and we're all human, right? And we're going to struggle, but we have a God that never leaves us or forsakes us, and no matter what you go through, he is there. Amen? Amen? I just want to review from, yes, from uh, last week. We defined what a rut is, and, and you can get these notes uh, on the serm after sermon uh, notes online. We defined a rut as any habitual pattern, persistent mindset, emotional stalemate, or comfortable position that robs us of the ability to move forward into God's best for victory and freedom in any area of our lives. And we all have them. Some are big, some are small, but they can be a habitual pattern. They can be an addiction. It can be a persistent mindset. It can be negativity. It can be taking things personally. That's one of my ruts, by the way. I shared one last week, but one of the other ones for me is that, you know, I've got a script going in my head. How many have a script from your past going in your head? And then all of a sudden, you know, Dorothy says something and it triggers something on a deep level. And it's her fault. <laughs> Not really, right? Hopefully when you're triggered because you've been offended, you realize that you look inside and say, where did that come from? Because it isn't the other person. It's what happens inside of us. Amen? So there's persistent mindset, emotional stalemate. Sometimes we feel things we don't want to feel. Sometimes we have grief and sometimes we have depression, anxiety, and things that just seem to not let go. But even in the midst of that, God is there. No matter darkness, you know, I, I appreciate Rick, Rick Davis being here today. He lost his wife um, this, what was it, this past week here. And so when you, when you think about it, it's like that's, a, that's, a, that's an emotion that just doesn't seem to go away. But you know what? God is in us, right? God is in you. He is with you in that struggle. And I just appreciate God for that and the family too. Amen. God is there. So last week we talked about God delivering the Israelites out of Egypt, and we looked at how difficult it was and how they did not seem to make it very well. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when I get into one of the personal ruts that I have, sometimes you just don't do very well, right? But God continues to bring me through, and he will bring us through. The first takeaway is that God, from last week, God always brings us home. He brought the Israelites to the promised land. Do you know what the promised land was? It was the land they already had before they went to Egypt. He always brings us back around. And he, he rescued them from Egypt with the Passover lamb, the, sin, the, the lamb that takes away the sins of the world, that rent that curtain in two. And we now have access to the Holy of Holies. And isn't it neat that the Passover lamb has, given, has brought us home? He's brought us home. And because of that, guess what we have? We have eternity. He's bringing us home. And that's kind of neat. Everything he does, he has one focus, to bring you home. All right? Number two, the journey is, not, is just as important as the destination. And we talked about that. And we talked about how the Israelites came, were coming out of Egypt. They knew no freedom. And they were influenced by generations that knew no freedom. And so the application for us is that the journey with God is designed. When we journey with God, no matter what your circumstances, it is designed to equip us, prepare us, strengthen us, and move us closer to him so that we can trust him for our lives and victory over any circumstance that we are going to have in our lives. There's a purpose to the journey. You see, the reality is when the Israelites experienced hardship, they wanted to sabotage their forward progress. They seemed to always want to go back. And God knew what he was going to do. He was going to feed them. He was going to bring them water. And yet the first thing they did was complain. 
And when they complained, they wanted to go back to Egypt. And what I'm hoping is not going to happen in this sanctuary with this people that God has and he holds on to us is that when we face hardship, we go forward. We don't look at the seas that are in front of us. We don't look at the obstacles that are in front of us. We look at what God can do through those obstacles. Amen? Amen. Sometimes you don't feel it, but he's working. Sometimes you don't see it, but he's working. I don't like that. I want to see it. Lord, can you give me a memo? Can you an email or something to tell me what you're doing? Can you give me a GPS coordination for what I am going to be going to? All right? But you know what? God takes us through the journey. And that's takeaway number two. Now we're going to focus here. Folks, I have to, under, I have to say this, and I almost skipped it in my notes. But our, our life scripts, our habits, our beliefs, our experiences can sabotage our efforts to receive God's best. What we believe, what we feel, what we are going through, the habits that we have, and what we call life scripts. It's things that are written inside of you that can still control you, can sabotage our efforts. And Paul talked about that in Romans 7, didn't he? I do the things I do not want to do and the things I can't seem to do, I do. And so he is right there in the midst of it. Because he said in Romans 8, 1, therefore there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Our focus on the journey must be on God so we don't give power to the past or our habitual responses. We're changing. God wants us to change. We have to, be tra- we have to transcend what we are used to to get what we really need from him. And I'll say that again. We, need, we have to transcend what we are used to, the Egypts of our lives, in order to get what we really need from him. You got to let it go. You got to move forward. And that's takeaway number three from last week is this, that God needs us to increase on our journey so we can achieve victory and his best for us. We must increase. And we're looking at Exodus 23. What is happening in Exodus 23 in verses 20 to 30 is really powerful. Because here's where God is saying to Moses, this is what I'm going to do when you cross the Jordan into the promised land. See, God brings us to the land. Now he's going to tell us what to do. And it says this, See, I am sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way. And I like the New Living Translation says, to protect you on your journey. I'm sending you an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. Pay attention to him and listen to what he says. Do not rebel against him. He will not forgive your rebellion since my name is in him. If you listen carefully to what he says and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and will oppose those who oppose you. My angel will go ahead of you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, and Jebusites, and I will wipe them out. Do not bow down before their gods or worship them or follow their practices. You must demolish them and break their sacred stones to pieces. Worship the Lord your God, and his blessing will be on your food and water. I will take away sickness from among you, and none will miscarry or be barren in your land. I will give you a full lifespan. And he says in verse 27, I will send my terror ahead of you and throw into confusion every nation you encounter. I will make all your enemies turn their backs and run. I will send the hornet ahead of you to drive out the Hivites, Canaanites, and Hittites out of your way. How many would be excited to hear that word? It's God is on. His, he's he's going to be with us. He's going to bring us through. He's going to defeat the enemies. All right, Lord, we're ready to go. Let's go. But look at verse 29 and 30. I will not, but I will not drive them out in a single year because the land will become desolate and the wild animals too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out before you until you've increased enough to take possession of the land. I've used this verse forever, especially in healing, because I really believe that God 
You know, there are enemies, there are things that are in our lives, there are thought processes, there are scripts that are running in our heads, there are habits, there are things that have us in bondage, but I got to tell you that God is still going to deal with the enemy of our obstacles, right? He's going to bring us through, but he may not do it in a single year, and that is the journey. So when we focus on the destination, as we talked about last week, we will get frustrated, and we're saying to God, I want Healing now. I want deliverance now. I want more money now. We all say that, don't we? But God is saying, little by little, I will drive them out before you. It is more important to walk in the journey than it is to know that he will deliver us from whatever. So there are three things to focus on in this scripture. Number one is the phrase, little by little. Sometimes healing is not immediate. But God helped them to grow into the land. He took care of it. If you go back and watch it, you know, you read it, and you can see how they came into Jericho. And God told them exactly what to do. But he's the one that delivered them. And then they went to Ai, and God showed them what to do. He will never leave his people. He is never going to leave you. And the little by little, when you face whatever it is you face, you can be assured that God is with you, and he will give you a plan to get you, get you through it. That's it. Little by little. And, you, and what I shared last week was, was, was that God could deliver you right now. He could take away every, every pain, everything that you're, you're going through. He can do it. He can do it. But who would we be? Sometimes he wants to work in our lives to get us to where he wants to be. And we may not know where that is. But I'm telling you that no matter what you feel, no matter what you're going through, no matter what rut you have, there is revival on the other side because you have a God that wants to save you. You have a God that wants to direct you. You have a God that wants to heal you in the middle of everything. Amen? But little by little. Number two, and this is an interesting thought, the enemies had a purpose. When you look at this story with the Israelites, the enemies that were in the land were actually preserving the land. And he said, look, I can't bring you a victory. I can't bring you into the land because there are enemies there. And so what I'm going to do is little by little, I will drive them out before you until you've what? Increased enough to take possession of it. Because God knew he could wipe out all the enemies right there. But he was dependent on the Israelites to grow, to increase in numbers in order to take over the land. And isn't that the same thing that God does for us today? That God will use our ruts and obstacles to cause us to trust in him and grow in him. Can you imagine having a flat tire and go, praise the Lord. Or, you know, what I hate, you know, is that we always talk about traffic, you know. You can, you know, get cut off in traffic and you just sing a praise to the God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There are people who can do that. I have yet to develop that, but he's working on me. <laughs> you can feel that flesh just rising up. And for some of us, there are just certain things that really rile us up. But listen... When you are increasing in the Lord, those enemies have to disappear. And that's the key to victory, is to keep increasing in the Lord. Don't let the enemy rule. Don't let your obstacles define who you are. But the enemies had a purpose. What God does, what he wants to do, is when we face our enemies, our obstacles, our ruts, and our hardships, is to know that he wants us to grow through the adversity. He wants us to be dependent on his strength and his might. He wants to get the glory for our victory. Can you imagine it? If we looked at our ruts and said, Lord, I, I, I just, I'm just going to praise you in the midst of it. Hey, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he is with me. And I can trust him for that deliverance. He wants to give us the strength to face our ruts. He wants us to be our refuge, a strength, an ever-present help in times of trouble. In Psalm 46. So little by little, the enemies had a purpose. The third thing is, 
is the importance of increase. And I just want to really emphasize this a little bit. In the Exodus account, the word increase means to be fruitful, flourish, multiplication. And in this context, in this story, it meant to grow as a nation. They had to grow as a nation in order for God to trust them with the land. So as they grew as a nation, they could fight the enemies and take possession of the land because God was with them. But he needed them. He needed them to fight the battles. He needed them because he knew that he was going to win. He had already said it. He is going to win. He is going to be with us. He's going to meet every one of their needs. So in the application for us, as we increase spiritually, and I love this point, as we increase spiritually, the enemy or obstacles in our lives lose their power. That is so important. I'm going to say it again. As we increase, as we get stronger in the Lord, as we read our Bibles, as we pray, we get into Bible studies, we disciple, we make the church stronger. When the obstacles come, we, that obstacle loses its power in your life. When I am triggered and I know that the insecurity is there and I'm reading things wrong, I can always go to the truth and know if I increase in the truth, that insecurity loses its power. But the key isn't trying to fight it on your own. The key is to allow God to give you the strength to get through it. Obstacles may always be with us. We're always going to have something that is going to happen. And some things will happen even today. But our focus on God keeps us in God's strength to face anything we are going to face. You see, genuine increase takes a couple of things. It takes a passion for the Lord. Sometimes we have to pray, Lord, give me a thirst and hunger. Because Jesus said, blessed are they that thirst and hunger after righteousness, for they shall be what? filled. We need passion. We need discipline. We need to be able to discipline ourselves to overcome the distractions to focus on the Lord. We need intention to overcome the inertia of our sin nature. And you know it's there, right? It just is relentless. Let me back this up with a a scripture in the New Testament, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 8. And this has been preached a lot as well. But listen to this. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance. You see that? These are ouchies. It's like, man, really, I have to do self-control? I have to be in self-control? I just want to lash out. Self-control, perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in what? increasing measure they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me reverse that. Is it possible that if we don't take these things and increase them and to work them in our lives, we might be ineffective and unproductive in our knowledge of Jesus Christ? We may not have the power to be able to face what our obstacles are, you know, what they're doing to us. And the obstacles themselves will define who we are. I don't want anybody in this room to allow any obstacle to define who you are. I want Jesus to define who you are. Because that's who you are. He's our way maker. He's our promise keeper. He's our light in the darkness. And he wants to be our strength in every situation. It may feel like he's not there. I guarantee you he is there. I feel the same thing sometimes when that darkness comes and and you get into a rut and you kind of wonder, where's God? Nobody here has ever done that, so, okay. But the important thing is I need to remember that God is always going to be with us. But we need to be intentional in growing. 
And that's the increase. You see, if we're stagnant in life, in your spirituality, if you are stagnant, you can grumble. It causes you to grumble in life. It causes you to be discouraged. It causes you to stay in Egypt. Whatever Egypt you have, it causes you to stay there. We can be overrun by our own perceptions and lies. We allow the enemy to have control over our lives and minds. Don't be stagnant. Move forward. And I know Ryan's going to continue to talk about this in the coming weeks. We need everyone and myself included to continue to move forward in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ and in our growth. How many of you, if your gas tank says E, you go to the gas station? How many of you, when you're hungry, you go and eat something? Why is it that we can't eat and serve the Lord Jesus Christ every day? Because we need to. Our, our tanks can be empty rather quickly. You take something that happens to you, and you see how quickly you can lose that encouragement. But you have to stay in the Lord. I want to close with just five things that we should have on our journey. Five things that we need to have. Number one, a proper perspective on our circumstances. A proper perspective in our circumstances. And I know I've preached about this before. But I need everyone to understand that he, we can keep ourselves grounded in God's plan, purpose, and presence is important in our lives. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, one of my favorite scriptures, Therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we, we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, what is seen, unseen is eternal. Do you know what that means? You know what Paul's trying to say? Is that any obstacle you face is not powerful. But what you can't see is powerful. That is eternal. And so when you turn your perspective upward, you're able to survive anything that goes on. Anything that goes on. All right? Do you remember Abraham? He was given a promise that his descendants would outnumber the stars in the sky. And it took 25 years for that promise to come true. Sort of like God did it on purpose. You know what I'm saying? He says, I want to receive the glory for it, so I'm going to do something that seems impossible to you. And so when he's 99 years old and Sarah's 90, they give birth to Isaac. Do you know what Isaac means? Laughter. Because if God came up to you at 90 and said you're going to get pregnant, you're probably going to laugh, right? It is such an important thing. So listen to this scripture in Romans 4 when it applies there. You talk about perspective. It says this, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. That is really baffling. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. So what does that mean? That means that he could not see what God was going to do in the natural. What he did see is the promise that God had for him. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, so, so became the father of many nations. Just as it has been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, Listen to this, verse 21. Being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he promised. God has the power to do what he promised. That is why it was credited to him as righteousness. Do you see? God can do that. And sometimes we don't have any hope in this world. And we shouldn't have hope in this world. But I love that phrase, against all hope. Abraham in hope believed because he said that when there is no hope on an earthly matter, when there is no hope in the flesh, there is hope in the Lord Jesus Christ who promised to be with us and never forsake us. He promised to always deliver us. He promised to love us. He promised to carry us home. Folks, I, I, we, we have to get ready. We have to change our perspective here. Stop believing the way that you have learned to believe. And, and look at what God has for you. It's different for everybody, right? But he's got something for you. Number two, develop and maintain a healthy perseverance. 
How many of you hate the word patience? Somebody ever tell you to be patient? I don't want to be patient. I am just impatient, and there are type A personalities that just want God to move right now. And there are some that just have a difficulty being where you are until God moves you. I've got to tell you, God will move. Develop perseverance. Do you know what James 1 and 2 to 4 says? Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know the testing of your faith develops what? Perseverance. And perseverance must finish this work so you're mature and complete, not lacking anything. It's like perseverance comes from trial, which matures us. I don't want that. I just want deliverance. I want freedom. Do you realize that in the midst of your bondage, God can give you that freedom? He can, his presence will be there. We just have to be patient with it. Hebrews chapter 10 It says here in verses 19 to 23, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. See, there's the journey. Draw near to God with a sincere heart. Don't let your heart be polluted by the circumstances that are going on. Yes, we are going to feel things. Yes, we're going to think things. But if I give the glory and I take your mind off of it, is it possible that God can deliver us from anything that we face? And the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us what? Hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. Hold unswervingly. I looked up that word and there are several translations. And here's what it tends to to mean in other translations. To hold tightly. To hold fast. The Orthodox Jewish Bible says, without wavering. The Wycliffe Bible says, bowing to no side, unpliable, don't break. And the Amplified says this, seize and hold fast and retain with, return, retain without wavering. When you have a perseverance, you are going to look straight ahead. And it doesn't matter what affects you. It doesn't matter what you're going through. You just persevere in the Lord. And he will be with you. This, you know, this really does sound simple, but very difficult, doesn't it? I mean, this is hard stuff. It's hard for me. This battle between the flesh and God. But you have to increase and be patient with God because he has a plan and a purpose. Number three, maintain a Jesus focus. We have to maintain a Jesus focus. We have to focus on him. When we, face on, uh, when we focus on Jesus who paid the price to earn the right to lead us as the good shepherd does, he will always get to where God wants us to be. You see, we are sheep. And you know sheep are stubborn. And we tend to walk away, but he always comes and he brings us back in line. But we know that he is the good shepherd. With him, we will also not grow weary and lose heart. Listen to what it says in Hebrews chapter 12. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. That's the journey. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. I always love that phrase, the author and perfecter of our faith. He is the one that authors our faith. He's the one that can perfect our faith. We're not going to muster faith. God gives it to us. And sometimes it just takes a little bit of faith to believe that Jesus is there. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners. That is really a powerful statement. Consider him, Jesus, who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The next time you're going through something, consider what Jesus had to go through. 
That's the Jesus focus. Man, he went through a lot. And yet, what did he do? He persevered, and he won the victory. And he came out of that grave, and the power of the resurrection is evident within us. He did it for us, for you, and for me. Number four, and we're getting ready to close. Take on an increasing spirituality mindset. We need to increase in our spirituality mindset. We need to develop an effective strategy for spiritual growth. In our own lives, figure out what you can do to continue every single day. And you've heard Pastor Ryan talk about this. And you've heard Pastor Kuhn talk about this. If, the, if this is the only spirituality you have, if this is the only filling station you have, what's going to happen on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday? We have to fill up every single day. We have to have a mindset that increases our spirituality because the, what, is, what did I say? The spirituality will help us overcome obstacles because we have God on our side. We need to always keep Jesus in the house, which is in our lives, and be intentional and persistent and focus on our dependency on God. Here's a very practical thing for you. How many of you, and when you go through something, you look, you open the Bible and you can't quite seem to find anything? You know? It's like I've heard a lot of people say that, you know, they're going through a crisis or something and they open the Bible and it doesn't seem like it's there. Let me tell you what you can do. My belief is that you actually start to grow in the Lord on the sunny days. Prepare on the sunny days so when the rainy days come, you have something planted in your heart and you can lean on Jesus. Do you know what? You need to carry your umbrella and you need to learn more about it so that when the rain comes, when whatever happens, it will help me and it will bring me to victory in Jesus. Amen? But you have to practice it. It's a nice day. I feel pretty good. Now's the time to prepare because I guarantee you there's going to be storms. Something will be faced in your life. Last thing I just want to share is that we need to eliminate the saboteurs of our growth. We need to eliminate those things that will cause us to want to go back to Egypt. What are those things? Complacency. Hopelessness and discouragement. Infectious attitudes. Negativity. Poisonous associations. And I love what AA and NA, you know, they have this idea that when you're recovering, you want to change people, places, and things. You want, to, you want to get away from people that are negative. You want to get away from the places that you keep going to get in, tr in trouble. And you want to change the things that you do. That's change. I would propose to us today that when we look at our lives, we don't allow anybody to be poisonous to us. We change maybe our friends if we have to, but we come together in a godly way and we get rid of people, places, and things that will sabotage our ability to see the hope of God in our lives. We need to know the truth so that that truth can set us free. We need, we need to get away from a comfort with our dysfunction. Where we are right now seems comfortable. There is an Egyptian mentality there, a bondage mentality that God wants to break. And as he's breaking it, he's with us. And even our unhealthy views of God and who he is. I got to tell you, our perception of God is important. Because if your perception is skewed, you will see him the wrong way. We need to see God for who he really is, not who we think he is. And that sabotages us because when we go through things, we end up going back to Egypt, into the old thought patterns. Where's God? You could hear the enemy in your head, didn't you? See, God's not there. You're all by yourself. But God wants us to know that he is there. 
Even if you can't see him, he's there. Amen? Let's stand together. Hallelujah. Ori is going to lead us in the same song that we sang last week. Because I, if you have anything, if you just, hey, I have a rut that I'm dealing with right now. I have something in my life. I have discouragement. I have anger. I have unforgiveness. I have depression or anxiety. Um, I'm just struggling in my life. I can't find the joy of the Lord, which is my strength. There's something I have to release to him. You need to come to the altar. But listen, when you come, don't just be a spectator. You know what I mean? Christianity is not a spectator sport. We cooperate and we just worship the Lamb of God and the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Listen to what you're singing and let God touch you. If you just need a touch from God, we'll have people to pray with you. So as she begins to lead us, we're going to come down and we're just going to spend just a minute or two with the Lord. How about that? Can we give them that much time? Amen. Let me, let me just close with this scripture in Ephesians 6. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Put on that full armor of God to take your stand against the devil's schemes. I love, and I've said this before, I'll say it again because I don't get to be up here very much. That's not, that's not a slam to Ryan, of course. He's the, he's the lead pastor. The schemes of the devil, the King James says the wiles of the devil, so you can escape the wiles of the devil. How many have ever seen the cartoon, The Roadrunner? And you know the coyote is always chasing the roadrunner. But the one thing that is so powerful to me is the roadrunner always knows and is always stronger and faster. How many of you want to be like the roadrunner? That the coyote comes after you. You could come down here and get some strength here. Let's, let's seal this as we continue to move from this series of rut to revival. Let's get revival. Let's get revival. Amen. All right. Hallelujah. How many of you know that God just spoke? It to confirm everything, Lord. And it is so funny because I just sense the resistance. There is some resistance. And it is hard. I know the time is short and you got to get to lunch. But how many of you know God is more important than that? Amen. He's more important than our schedules. But we won't delay. We'll let you go. But listen, you see what? There's resistance in here. If I'm sitting in the audience and I know I have to deal with something, I know resistance comes in. I know what that feels like. And sometimes you have to push through. You have to push through. You have to look at God, not your resistance, and not what is causing you to, re to resist. I've resisted for years sometimes because I don't want God to come too close to me because he might actually touch whatever's going on in my heart. And sometimes you could feel that. I could feel that. God is the God of light, and in him there's no darkness at all. And you invite him in. He's not just searching for something. His light just exposes it. And it's almost like God is going, what? You brought me in? Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. Thank you for who you are. You are personally here in every heart. And I pray, Lord, that you would guide and direct our hearts, even as we leave. We've heard what was said, that as we leave today, we're gonna, you're going to be with us in our ruts. You're going to be with us in any situation. You're going to lift us out of any despair that we have. And we're just going to leave it there. Confirm your word, Lord, in our lives. So we honor you today. Continue to be with us throughout this week and through this series. Just be with Pastor Ryan as he moves forward in this series. Lord, we honor you today. Be with us this week. Give us a great week in you, we pray. And let us rejoice always, 
even in our circumstances that we face. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.